In July of 1863, the farm owned by William Bliss and his family was a 60 acre tract of land that had the unfortunate fate of being located midway between the Confederate and Union armies, respectively positioned on Seminary Ridge to the west and Cemetery Ridge to the east. Beginning on the morning of July 2nd, And continuously until the early afternoon of July 3rd, skirmishers and sharpshooters from both sides exchanged occupancy of the large Pennsylvania Bank barn and the adjacent two story farmhouse. The farm buildings changed hands at least nine times. When the rebels were in control of the buildings, sharpshooters used the second floor of the barn and farmhouse to fire at Union infantry lines in general. And more specifically, the horses and gunners of the artillery batteries 700 yards away. More than just an annoyance, they inflicted numerous casualties. Likewise, when the Union forces had possession of the farm, they pushed rebel soldiers back to the edges of the Bliss Orchard, extending 150 yards to the west and 150 yards to both north and south. They too fired effectively at rebel infantry and battery targets along the ridge. By midday on the 3rd, Union senior officers had had enough, and after taking control of the farm one last time, they ordered both buildings to be burned. This is the story of the 30 plus hours of back and forth fighting for control of the Bliss Farm. This video has been extracted from a comprehensive work that encompasses every inch of the Gettysburg Battlefield, a highly detailed animation covering over 60 hours of conflict that took place on July 1st through 3rd, 1863. For more information about this acclaimed work and how you can use it to explore the entire battlefield in battle, visit our website. GettysburgAnimated.com. The 16th Vermont Regiment spent the night of July 1st through 2nd on a skirmish line running northeast to southwest and positioned midway between the Bliss Farm and the Emmitsburg Road. The Bliss family had hastily evacuated their home sometime on July 1st. They left the doors open, the table set, and the beds made. Shortly after dawn, The diminished brigade of Brigadier General Alfred Scales, now commanded by William Lawrence after Scales was wounded on July 1st, was ordered to establish a skirmish line in the fields in front of the Confederate artillery, in line on Seminary Ridge. Lawrence's line stretched about a mile, from the Bliss Farm to the Henry Spangler Farm to the south. While rebel official reports are sketchy, Letters and memoirs of the individual soldiers suggest that the 38th North Carolina had a strong presence in and around the Bliss farm buildings. To their front was the 16th Vermont, and the sporadic firing of the two opposing skirmish lines began. The two skirmish lines took pot shots at one another for almost two hours. Before the 16th Vermont skirmishers withdrew back toward the main lines of the 1st Corps on Cemetery Ridge, south of Ziegler's Grove. With the fields before them now void of Union skirmishers all the way to that ridge, the northern end of Lawrence's skirmish line moved closer to the Emmitsburg Road to the cover provided by some brush choked fence lines. The brigades of Baxter, Coulter, and Stannard. Had taken up positions on Cemetery Ridge late on July 1st, after their retreat through the streets of Gettysburg. Now they were starting to retire to Cemetery Hill, soon to be relieved by Hancock's 2nd Corps, approaching from the south. The 2nd Corps brigades of Carroll, Smythe, and Willard, and the batteries of Woodruff and Arnold, take up positions on Cemetery Ridge. Woodruff's guns are at the western edge of Ziegler's Grove, and Arnold's battery is behind a stone wall, just to the right of the point where it turns due west for 75 yards and then turns 90 degrees south again. That juncture will later become known as the Angle. Willard's and Smythe's regiments are between the two batteries. 
Minutes after they settle in, the 12th New Jersey, 14th Connecticut, and 1st Delaware send out skirmishers. But they get only as far as the Emmitsburg Road before effective fire from Lawrence's skirmishers halt their advance. The casualties begin to mount. Authors David Schultz and Scott McGinnis Sr. in their book The Second Day at Gettysburg, The Attack and Defense of Cemetery Ridge, write, quote, Rebel sharpshooters, planted along the fences between the Bliss property and the Emmitsburg Road, became so deadly they were knocking down men in Woodruff's gun line west of Ziegler's Grove, unquote. They go on to say, quote, Sharpshooters using the Bliss barn and house continued hitting the artillerists in Arnold's battery, along with the men in the 14th Connecticut and the 12th New Jersey to their right, unquote. Union skirmishers were unable to dislodge their Confederate counterparts, and General Hayes, in command of the 3rd Division of the 2nd Corps, decided something more aggressive needed to be done. The 1st Delaware, roughly 250 men, received the order, and they became the first Federal troops on July 2nd to cross the Emmitsburg Road in force. Schultz and McGinnis described the move, writing, quote, Lieutenant Colonel Edward Harris's 1st Delaware double time down the Bryan farm lane and out the Bliss farm lane under a hail of small arms fire, unquote. They took control of the Bliss farm buildings and pushed back the 38th North Carolina and 13th North Carolina, who were deployed as skirmishers. This marked the first of nine times that the farm buildings changed hands over the next 30 hours. Gibbon's 2nd Corps Division follows Hayes' division to Cemetery Ridge. His skirmishers move across the Emmitsburg Road into the fields just to the southeast of the Bliss farm buildings. Two companies each from the 20th Massachusetts and 42nd New York of Hall's Brigade and the 72nd Pennsylvania and the 106th Pennsylvania of Webb's Brigade. Acting on a direct order from General Meade, the 106th Pennsylvania Company B is sent forward, and in the words of Captain Lynch, the company commander, quote, entrusted with the important duty of ascertaining whether the enemy was in force on Seminary Ridge, unquote. Upon arrival, it took just minutes to assess the situation, and Lynch later wrote, quote, Having accomplished what was desired and shown the commanding general what he was most anxious to know, the company coolly retired to a position as a reserve on the skirmish line, unquote. By the time of the 106 Pennsylvania Company B's exploratory foray, Brigadier General Posey's brigade of Major General Anderson's division of Hill's Corps had taken up a position on Seminary Ridge behind two of Major John Lane's batteries. Lorenz's skirmishers, after having been driven back by the 1st Delaware, had taken refuge on the western edge of the Bliss Orchard, and from there behind fence lines they sniped at their Union counterparts on the opposite side of that orchard for over a half an hour. But now the Confederates had additional resources at hand. Posey soon deployed a line of skirmishers comprised of the 16th Mississippi Company C and the 19th Mississippi Company A, and they advanced joining the rebel skirmish line. From there, supported by fire from the 38th North Carolina, Posey's men advanced against the 1st Delaware, pushing them back from the field west of the Bliss Barn and House to positions in and around those buildings. A consolidation of rebel forces in the northern part of the orchard now included skirmishers from the 14th Georgia, Thomas's brigade, of Pender's division. They all continued to apply the pressure. As Company C of the 16th Mississippi swings around to the northeast side of the house, the right wing of the 1st Delaware falls back and finds itself separated from the left wing 
on the opposite side of the barn. In the chaos, junior officers can't locate Colonel Harris, in command of the 1st Delaware. He is sequestered in the basement of the barn where he has established his headquarters. After Harris was finally located, 1st Lieutenant John Brady advised him of the increasingly dire situation. About Harris, Brady later wrote, quote, He, after carefully venturing from his safe retreat and taking a very hasty glance over the situation, turned and fled precipitously toward our main line, leaving that portion of the field in the immediate charge of 1st Lieutenant Charles Tanner and myself." Unquote. As Harris ran toward safety, with the right flank falling apart, Lieutenants Brady and Tanner rallied a courageous few to make a stand along the southern side of the fence that paralleled the Bliss farm lane. From that temporary cover, they fired one or two well-directed volleys at the advancing Mississippians. As a result, the 16th Mississippi Company C shifted its position in front of the Bliss farmhouse, moving to the west toward the barn and flanking the 1st Delaware right wing. Author Elwood Christ, in his book The Struggle for the Bliss Farm at Gettysburg, elaborates on the rebels' oblique move, writing, quote, The movement further split the two wings of the 1st Delaware. Cut off from the rest of the regiment, and now missing Tanner, who had been wounded and left the field, Brady had no other alternative but to fall back to Cemetery Ridge, unquote. As Company C of the 16th Mississippi was sliding to the south in front of the Bliss House to flank the 1st Delaware right wing, as explained earlier, Company A of the 19th Mississippi, along with some of Lawrence's skirmishers, were coming around the southwest end of the barn. When the right wing withdraws, the left wing of the 1st Delaware, with their right flank now exposed, is in a precarious position. They find themselves between two groups of rebel skirmishers and caught in a crossfire. They have no choice but to withdraw. The 1st Delaware left wing rejoins the right wing at the Emmitsburg Road, except for Company K, which takes a position on the right of the 106th Pennsylvania skirmish line. Control of the Bliss House and Barn returns to Posey skirmishers, changing hands for the second time this morning. As the 1st Delaware was being driven back from the Bliss Farm, Brigadier General Alexander Hayes realizes the ground to the west of the Emmitsburg Road to his front would soon be devoid of skirmishers from his division. Gibbon's division was to the south, and the brigade on his right was commanded by Brigadier General Alexander Webb, nicknamed the Philadelphia Brigade, and had a line of skirmishers in their front. To the north of Hayes, Colonel Orlando Smith's brigade of von Steinwehr's division of the 11th Corps also had a line of skirmishers deployed to the west. Hayes acted quickly to fill the skirmish line gap created by the retreat of the 1st Delaware. One of the first details belatedly sent to the aid of the 1st Delaware was four companies of the 4th Ohio. Within minutes, they were followed by companies of skirmishers from the 111th New York and the 125th New York of Willard's Brigade, and the 108th Pennsylvania of Smythe's Brigade, all crossing the Emmitsburg Road. The last reinforcing unit to move was the 39th New York, advancing toward the Bliss Farmyard, taking up a position on the right side of the Bliss House, where they remained on the skirmish line with one interruption for four hours. After the better part of an hour, the ebb and flow of heavy skirmishing against Posey's Mississippians and Thomas's Georgians resulted in the 39th beginning to waver. A trickle of soldiers withdrawing turned into larger numbers retreating in disorder. General Hayes and a few aides, all on horseback, under fire and fervently waving the divisional flag, 
rode from the main line on the ridge into the maelstrom of disheartened skirmishers. Author James A. Woods, in his book Gettysburg, Day Two, The Ebb and Flow of Battle, writes, quote, General Hayes felt compelled to ride out to the skirmish line to bolster his troops' apparent flagging resolve. Hayes's presence on the skirmish line soon convinced the retreating 39th New York that the line could be held after all, and they promptly rallied, unquote. Reinvigorated, the 39th New York returns to the area northeast of the Bliss Farmhouse. They are joined on the left by Company I of the 12th New Jersey and the reorganized 1st Delaware, including Company K. The Union force pushes back the skirmishers of the 16th Mississippi and the 19th Mississippi, and the Confederates again take up positions on the western edge of the orchard. The 39th New York reestablishes their original position, while the 1st Delaware and 12th New Jersey group form their new line just to the west of the Bliss Farm buildings. With the Union soldiers back in control of the Bliss Farm, it marks the third time that the farm has changed hands. After the Union skirmishers retook control of the Bliss Farm, a midday lull ensued. Lawrence's brigade, on the skirmish line since shortly after sunrise, is finally ordered to withdraw. Confederate reports and documents are sketchy, and historical authors are relatively silent with respect to the unit movements during this lull. Elwood Crist cites an entry in the diary of a soldier in Company B, 16th Mississippi, writing, quote, Around 1 p.m. we relieved Scales's brigade, unquote. James Woods writes, quote, About the same time Lawrence's brigade moved out, its skirmishers were replaced by members of the 3rd Georgia. Unquote. A bit later, James Woods notes, quote, After nearly four hours on the skirmish line, the 39th New York withdraws from the Bliss Farm area, rejoining the brigade on Cemetery Ridge. Skirmishers from the 125th New York and 111th New York also withdraw at this time." Unquote. Midway through the afternoon, when Longstreet's artillery opened fire to the south, it signals the beginning of the long-awaited Confederate attack that was to be made in Echelon. As a result, the situation begins to heat up around the Bliss Farm, and General Posey begins a process of strengthening his thin skirmish line. He is ordered to send two regiments to support that line, but he executes the order in a piecemeal manner, with only the right wing of one regiment, the 19th Mississippi, advancing at this time. In his official report, Colonel Harris of the 19th Mississippi writes, quote, about four o'clock, I received orders to advance the right wing of my regiment until I encountered the enemy's skirmishers and drive them back, unquote. They advanced at the double quick, about 250 yards, to the fence line at the western boundary of the orchard. It should be noted the 19th Mississippi's Colonel Nathaniel Harris is not the same officer as the previously referenced Lieutenant Colonel Edward Harris of the 1st Delaware. The importance of this differentiation will become clear momentarily. Emboldened by the arrival of Harris's 19th Mississippi Wing, Company C of the 16th Mississippi advances to occupy the Bliss Farmhouse. That move causes a reaction by the other Harris, of the 1st Delaware. With ammunition being exhausted, but without orders, Lieutenant Colonel Edward Harris withdraws the right wing of the 1st Delaware. For his actions, he is placed under arrest by General Hancock. With the rebels again firing from in and around the Bliss farmhouse, and the right wing of the 1st Delaware unilaterally withdrawing, the Mississippians pour flanking fire into the remaining soldiers of the 1st Delaware and the 12th New Jersey, who were defending the ground to the south and eastern sides of the barn. After impatiently waiting for the 2nd of Posey's regiments to join the line on his right, Colonel Nathaniel Harris, 
advances his command without them, charging the Bliss Barn, enforcing the 1st Delaware left wing and Company I of the 12th New Jersey back to the Emmitsburg Road. The 19th Mississippi right wing, including Companies A and B, reoccupies the Bliss Barn. It has changed hands yet again, the fourth time this day. The situation for the Federals at this point continued to deteriorate. In his monument dedication remarks, Captain James Lynch of the 106th Pennsylvania recalled that after the withdrawal of the 1st Delaware left wing, quote, the flanking fire from the Bliss House and Barn, when occupied by Posey's Mississippians, became very destructive to Company A of the 106th Pennsylvania, and they gave way, unquote. This move in turn now leaves the right flanks of the 72nd and the 42nd Pennsylvania skirmish line exposed to the infilating fire. The withdrawal of Company A and the significant increase in flanking fire causes Lynch to leave his men and go forward to investigate and report his discovery. Thinking there is only a small contingent of rebels in the buildings, Lynch is ordered to move forward to retake the farm buildings with only his single company. Unfortunately, there are over 200 men from the 19th Mississippi in and behind the barn. Elwood Christ picks up the story at that point, writing, quote, The Confederates in the barn allowed him to advance very close to them and demanded his surrender, which Lynch and his men refused to do. The Southerners opened fire and drove Company B back to their picket reserve some 500 yards away, unquote. After the gallant but unsuccessful charge of the 106th Pennsylvania Company B, and with General Hayes growing increasingly irritated by the incessant sniper fire at his soldiers and artillerymen, he confers with Colonel Smythe in command of his 2nd Brigade. When Hayes asks if he, quote, has a regiment that will drive them out, Smythe replies, quote, yes, sir, the 12th will do it. Then Smythe turns to Major Hill, commander of the 12th, and adds, quote, but I don't want all of you, Major, unquote. And so it is that four companies, B, E, G, and H, of the 12th New Jersey, are detailed to retake the Bliss Barn. The column advances part way undetected due to the topography before forming a line of battle and charging. The survivors of the 106th Pennsylvania Company B join the charge. In his official report, Major Hill wrote, quote, Under the command of Captain Jobes, they charged gallantly upon the building, surrounding it, capturing 92 prisoners, unquote. The 12th New Jersey's charge accomplished the task of retaking the barn, but the rebels still occupied and fired from the house. What happens next has its share of historical controversy. Captain J. Park Postles of the 1st Delaware Company A was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for a courageous and harrowing horseback ride from Cemetery Ridge to the Bliss Barn, and while still on horseback and under fire, verbally delivering an order. That is a fact on which the historians agree. However, the details of the events that are not agreed upon, somewhat unbelievably, are first, which day did the ride take place? July 2nd or 3rd? Also, what was the verbal order he shouted before reining his horse around and galloping back to the main line from whence he came? The actual Medal of Honor General Order was issued on July 22, 1892, and the citation states that his courageous act took place on July 2nd. In the book Deeds of Valor, How American Heroes Won the Medal of Honor, written by W.F. Beyer and O.F. Cadell in 1907, they also cite that the ride took place, quote, in the afternoon of July 2nd, unquote, and that the verbal order from General Hayes was to, quote, have the men in the barn take that damned white house and hold it at all hazards, unquote. While we have illustrated the July 2nd version of events here, 
We have also included an appendix at the end of this video narrative that contains, for your consideration, the alternate July 3rd version of Postel's Medal of Honor actions. The chaos inflicted by the Union force at the barn results in the 19th Mississippi surviving occupants scampering out the back doors and into the orchard. About the same time, Posey finally sends out the 48th Mississippi to the fields west of the barn, nearly an hour after sending out Colonel Harris with the right wing of the 19th Mississippi. As the 48th Mississippi takes up a position in the Bliss Farm Orchard, the Union focus changes to the farmhouse, of which Postles wrote, quote, Our men in the barn, upon receipt of the order, promptly proceeded to charge and took the damned White House, capturing 40 prisoners, unquote. The redirected assault on the house forced a few uncaptured 16th Mississippi skirmishers to also withdraw to the orchard. With the Federals now back in control, the count on the number of times the Bliss Farm has changed hands now stands at five. In response to the Federal seizure of the Bliss House and Barn, Posey finally dispatches the balance of the 16th Mississippi. They take up position on the western edge of the Bliss Orchard, to the right of the reorganizing 19th Mississippi. The arrival of the bulk of the 16th on the Confederate skirmish line brings the total number of rebels positioned in the orchard to nearly 800 men. The four companies of the 12th New Jersey, along with the 106th Pennsylvania Company B, total about 200, one quarter of the size of the opposing force. Prudence dictates that they withdraw from the Bliss Farm buildings, and for the moment they are left empty. The Bliss Farm buildings remain empty for nearly an hour. Longstreet's Grand Assault is slowly moving northward, one brigade at a time. Wilcox advances, and then a few minutes later Lang, and then still later Wright, and finally Posey. The left wing of the 19th Mississippi and the entire 12th Mississippi advance toward the Confederate skirmish line at the farm. They move out shortly after Wright's brigade has swept forward on their left. Posey's advance is intended to be the next element in Lee's echelon attack, but the fragmented manner in which he has deployed the regiments in his brigade becomes the first in a series of events that grind the Longstreet assault to a halt. Wright's brigade has come abreast of Posey's skirmishers on the left, in the Bliss Orchard, and after pausing at his skirmish line to absorb the second Georgia skirmishers, Wright resumes his advance toward the Emmitsburg Road, and Posey's heavy skirmish line joins the attack, the front portion of the line moving past the Bliss buildings. But the 19th Mississippi left wing and the 12th Mississippi lag behind. The 16th Mississippi the 19th Mississippi right wing and the 48th Mississippi, all on Posey's front line, continue to move forward toward the Emmitsburg Road, as the 19th Mississippi left wing, in the second line, advances past the Bliss farm buildings. At the rear of the brigade, the 12th Mississippi heads towards those structures. The long line of Second Corps skirmishers, who have been fighting for control of the Bliss Farm since the early morning hours, now find themselves under significant pressure as the advance of Wright's and Posey's brigades draws closer. They are finally forced back to the Emmitsburg Road and beyond, but to the north, skirmishers from the 8th Ohio west of the Emmitsburg Road, and then the main body of the 8th Ohio behind a fence along that road, begin to focus their fire on Posey's left flank. General Posey is with the 12th Mississippi and halts them when they reach the Bliss Barn. He reports that his three other regiments are well in advance, with the 48th Mississippi reaching the Emmitsburg Road fence line on the left of Wright's brigade. But they go no further. Meanwhile, the 19th and 16th Mississippi stop their advance to the left rear of the 48th, 
midway between the Bliss buildings and the Emmitsburg Road. Two main factors contribute to the halt. First, Mahone's brigade does not advance to support Posey's left. And second, Thomas's skirmishers of Perrin's brigade, in Long Lane, fail to apply significant pressure to the line of Union skirmishers in their front, specifically the 8th Ohio mentioned earlier, allowing them to continue to focus on Posey's left. While the rebels by default again take control of the Bliss Farm, the sixth and final change of hands on July 2nd, Longstreet's advance this afternoon has sputtered to a halt. As darkness takes control of the battlefield, Posey orders his brigade back to Seminary Ridge, and soon the 48th Mississippi begins to withdraw, after holding their skirmish line position on the west side of Emmitsburg Road for over an hour. As they head back to the western ridge, they're joined by the 19th, 16th, and 12th Mississippi regiments. Skirmishers from the 12th Mississippi remain behind in the Bliss farmyard, in control of the farmhouse and the bank barn. They will remain there overnight. The back-and-forth fight for command of the Bliss buildings has ended for the day. In a little over seven hours, it will again be daylight on the battlefield. It will be July 3rd, a day that will climax with the historic late afternoon grand charge of the divisions of Pickett, Pettigrew, and Trimble against the Union Army entrenched on Cemetery Ridge with an unnamed copse of trees at its crest. But from dawn until noon, the Bliss Farm Buildings will again be at the center of the same deadly skirmish fire, charge, and countercharge, before being intentionally burned and reduced to smoldering ruins. An alternate account of Postel's Ride, occurring on July 3rd, is proposed in the History of the First Delaware Volunteers, authored by William Savell in 1884. In describing the events, he writes, quote, The 14th Connecticut was now ordered to dislodge the enemy, and while this detachment was charging on the buildings, General Hayes called for a volunteer to carry an order to the commanding officer to burn the house and outbuildings, unquote. A more detailed version appears in a souvenir booklet prepared for the 14th Connecticut Regimental Reunion in September of 1891. There, Divisional Commander Colonel Smythe is quoted as telling Lieutenant Seymour, who was part of the 14th Connecticut Advancing Unit, that, quote, If they make it too hot for you, burn the building and return to the line, unquote. But Seymour fell wounded before he could complete his mission, so the 14th Connecticut, ignorant of the order to burn the house, held their beleaguered place in the barn. This narrative continues that headquarters, quote, seemed to become aware of the desperate straits of our men, and General Hayes sent them instructions to burn the building and return to the main line, unquote. So which was it? Which day? Which verbal order? July 2nd? and take that damn White House and hold it at all hazards, or July 3rd, and burn the building and return to the main line. <laughs> 